not working on firing of neurons, not even working on biochemical reactions at synapses, uh, but uh, through working on uh, this electromagnetic field of the brain as a whole. Hey everybody, welcome to Tech Recyc, where we combine the latest neurotechnology and aging wisdom to supercharge your brain. I'm Dr. Cody Rawl, your medical doctor confidant. Today we are looking at an incredibly interesting device, the Neo Rhythm. I've gotten so many questions on YouTube about this device and I can't wait to share with you what I found out. Now, if you've paid any attention to the neuro wearable space, you might have seen some of the videos that the company's put out, and it's generated a lot of questions, and rightly so. And the main questions are, does this device actually work? And I think the questions are warranted because this is a device that uses a very unique mechanism of action that we haven't seen before in the form of a neuro wearable. I've reviewed other devices like Halo Sport that uh, uses direct electrical stimulation to the motor cortex to improve athletic endurance. I've taken a look at uh, neuro wearables like Think that stimulated the trigeminal nerve to induce different uh, aspects of relaxation and vigilance, but never before have we seen a wearable that actually uses pulses from magnets to influence the resonant uh, frequencies of the overall brain. The packaging looks great and it's very professional with all the different head positions and settings that you can use with it. Eight hours of battery life, gesture controlled, and Bluetooth capable TMS in the palm of your hand. It has additional padding to meet any head size, directions for use, and even a little piece of metal in a test tube that you can use to hear the magnetic pulse frequencies. The charger is standard micro USB and easy to use. Now this device uses technology that's been around since the late 1980s called transmagnetic stimulation. There's been a ton of research over the years taking a look at different magnetic strengths that can alter the function and resonance patterns of the brain. So we're gonna take a look at the history of transmagnetic stimulation. We're gonna to talk to the head scientist of Neorhythm, Dr. Igor German, and then we're also gonna dive into my own personal experiences of using this device during everyday tasks, as well as during meditation, so stick around. Now there's a variety of different ways that you can get your brain to fire at different frequencies. And we know that your brain firing at different frequencies has different subjective experiences. If you're in theta, you might be drowsy. If you're in alpha, you might be relaxed. If you're in beta, you're hyper alert or maybe even anxious. These firing patterns really determine how we feel. So it can be really important to understand how we can alter those firing patterns to reach optimal levels of subjective experience. So one of the most direct and sought out ways is through different practices like meditation to affect your own brain firings so that you have more control over your emotions, uh, better mood and less anxiety during the day, better focus, all the benefits that you hear about meditation. Uh, there are other methods. You can actually affect the firing patterns of the brain through the cranial nerves like the vision and auditory nerves through things like audiovisual entrainment that I've talked about on this channel before. And you can also use direct electrical stimulation into different nerves, things like Think tried to do that through the vagus nerve. Or you could actually use a magnetic pulse, and this is what transmagnetic stimulation uses. You can actually use a magnetic pulse, which if you remember, magnetism, magnetic fields actually causes electrons to move. If you have a strong enough electrical pulse, you can have the neurons in the brain fire and actually create a resonance pattern. You can actually create different frequency resonance patterns within the brain, which translates into different subjective states. So around the late 1980s, we became more comfortable with magnetism. We were using it to set up magnetic fields for our MRI machines to take pictures inside the body that were giving us levels of detail that we had never seen before. And magnetism's measured in the level of Tesla, so MRI machines usually operate in magnetic fields from 1.5 to 7 Tesla. And then people started taking a look at, can we use magnetic fields to actually induce 
the neurons of the brain into firing patterns and potentially use that as a treatment. So a ton of research was done through the 90s and 2000s taking a look at something called transmagnetic stimulation where you could use magnetic pulses to cause the discharge of neurons within the brain in certain areas of the brain both for scientific study and for treatment. And in 2008, the FDA actually approved transmagnetic stimulation for the treatment of major depressive disorder. You actually have someone sitting in a chair and there's a probe attached to the chair that releases a magnetic field and it causes the neurons within the frontal lobe to discharge. And there's a lot of debate on how this actually helps depression, but the idea is, in some people, that area is simply underactivated and the TMS machine helps uh, activate those certain neurons to improve people's mood and it really can help for people with major depressive disorder especially people that have not responded well to therapy or medications or any other treatments it's a lot less invasive than ECT which a lot of people find you know quite understandably quite scary so TMS has become a nice augmentative treatment for the treatment of depression I've been around clinical TMS quite a bit we used it a lot actually at the Walter Reed Hospital where I did my Navy residency training and it's really interesting that people sit in the chair and have the magnetic probe actually placed over their motor cortex in order to test the magnetic field strength. And when you do the pulses, their thumb actually will uh, twitch a little bit. So you know that the device is actually working and then you move it forward to the frontal lobe to do the actual clinical treatment. And it can be really good augmented treatment for major depressive disorder. We are also using it off label for things like post-traumatic stress disorder as well. So when it comes to actually using TMS to affect the firing patterns of our brain, some really interesting research has been coming up and that's where the neo rhythm actually comes into this because what we're looking at is a device that actually uses a smaller magnetic field. So the ones that actually induce the discharge of neurons within the clinical TMS use around two to three Tesla, whereas the neo rhythm actually uses uh, magnetic strengths in the uh, size of millitesla, which is quite a bit smaller than the actual Tesla range. Uh, but this is still quite a bit more powerful than what our cell phones or everyday appliances would admit, which are more in the micro Tesla range. So we're taking a look at a device that uses a medium range Tesla magnetic field strength to induce the resonance patterns within our brain. So some really far out scientific stuff. And luckily I was able to talk to Dr. Igor German, the head scientist of NeoRhythm, to dive in further how this actually affects the brain, how it actually can affect the firing patterns of the brain and the subjective response of people to this device to achieve things like more relaxation, uh, more attention, or even altered states that you can use in meditation. Because I'm also a professor at our uh, university, I used to lecture by electromagnetics and uh, uh, were certain young researchers uh, that successfully finished uh, their doctorates in bioelectromagnetics with me. Our work was in a way, of course, divided. Uh, the group uh, around Marco worked more on this uh, building of the device, uh, you know, generating, um, composing uh, the device uh, that it is suitable, you know, to wear and so on. Um, but um, the Bayern group, actually, because uh, we were more on the scientific uh, side, we um, made an expertise uh, into stimulation fields uh, that prove themselves to be the most effective uh, in stimulation certain states of uh, brains, and that um, all of them uh, was on this low level RTMS, um, RTMS uh, um, stimulation regime. So it was found that even stimulation regime of four hertz, which corresponds to, does a border between tel delta and theta waves, you know, um, was uh, very, um, effective to induce sleep or to improve sleeping through the night. Um, our expectation uh, was, because we read a lot of literature concerning such stimulation, that there should come to the entrainment, uh, which means uh, some resonant effects between the, this incidental uh, 
magnetic field uh, that simulated, uh, it was a simulation regime of, let's say, alpha waves, so that they would, uh, it would induce alpha waves in uh, our brains, you know. Not working on uh, firing of neurons, not even working on biochemical reactions at synapses, uh, but uh, through working on uh, this electromagnetic field of the brain as a whole, in a way, so that to resonantly, uh, to, to come to this resonance. But we, if, if you are with the resonance, um, it is not a simple thing, you know, uh, because the literature also shows that um, we can uh, count also on subharmonics of our uh, main frequency, which means if we use, let's say, 8 hertz, uh, even um, some oscillation at 4 hertz or 2 hertz can be mm. stimulated, so this is subharmonics, or higher harmonics, uh, so if we again use 8 hertz, um, 16 hertz, uh, uh, or 24 hertz or something in between can be also stimulated. This means that um, uh, you, you cannot be wise uh, in advance. You should do the experiment using uh, such and such um, stimulation regime and see what really are the effects because they can be different from expectations. Mm -hmm. I hope you enjoyed Dr. German's description of their testing, and I'm going to post his full interview on the channel next week. But for now, we're going to take the next five minutes of this video to do a deep dive into his papers based on the randomized control trials they did with the NeoRhythm. It's going to be really important to back up the science of this device, and it's going to be really important, but a little dry. So if you want to jump ahead to my actual experiences of the device, go to about minute 17 and a half. Otherwise, let's take a look at these super interesting papers and the hardcore science behind the NeoRhythm. Now, Dr. German has published two papers based on randomized control trials he did with the moderate intensity TMS of NeoRhythm while recording both subjective and objective measures of the test participants. He's very fair in the papers to note that whereas in high intensity TMS on the clinical side, there's clear physiological effects through evocation of action potentials, whereas with the NeoRhythm technology in the moderate TMS range, it's more difficult to measure those effects, most likely because they are working on, quote, endogenous electromagnetic and dipolar oscillations within cells themselves, and that's a direct quote from the paper. He spent a good deal of time discussing the logical theory that magnetic wave pulses from the device should influence the waves of the brain through the same frequency through the property of resonance, but this isn't always the case. And this is why they had to systematically go through the literature and perform multiple different frequency tests and experiments to determine what stimulation frequencies work best to achieve the frequencies desired in the brain. There seems to be significant subharmonic and high harmonic effects of the stimulation frequencies. For example, in the literature, it was shown that a frequency of 50 hertz didn't necessarily create a frequency of 50 hertz in the brain, that it actually influenced 8 hertz, which is in the alpha range, which is two and a half octaves lower than the stimulation frequency. So you can see how those subharmonics are being affected from the higher frequency of the stimulation of the device that translate into lower frequencies of stimulation in the brain. Similarly, with a one hertz stimulation from a device, they could actually stimulate second and third octaves higher stimulations in the brain, meaning that a one hertz stimulation from a device did not create more one hertz of delta, it actually created second and third octave higher theta and alpha frequencies in the brain. So they took 25 volunteers for the studies and they measured subjective scores as well as objective measures such as EEG brainwaves, skin conductance, heart rate variability, respiration rate, and thoracic expansion during respiration, which are all objective measures that would measure whether people are relaxed or stimulated or any of them in between. The first paper that I'll review is where they were trying to induce relaxation. So to try and target alpha in the brain, they used an alpha wave from the device for a direct resonance effect, and that was on the back of the head, on the back coil 
of the device. And then they also used a lesser intensity, a lower Tesla intensity subharmonic from the delta range on the temporal lobes. And this was based on literature that had been done before. So this is a full on randomized control trial where they had sham exposed controls, meaning people had the device on where it actually wasn't turned on and emitting magnetic pulses versus people that had the device on that was actually functioning and emitting the magnetic pulses. And they also did another group where people were informed that device would be on and the device was on during the experiment. So for this experiment with the relaxation protocol, there was a statistically significant increase in alpha waves, which demonstrated that people were more relaxed. But interestingly enough, and this is kind of a theme for these papers, is that they also witnessed increased beta waves. So what does that mean? Because you would expect increased beta waves to be less relaxed. Well, the interpretation was the higher alpha waves with accompaniment of beta waves indicated that there was more relaxation without drowsiness. And what they also saw is that there was a dampening of theta and delta waves, which suggested a more awakened relaxed state. So rather than the relaxation protocol getting people relaxed, but also drowsy and sort of falling asleep, it was a relaxed attentive state, which would be better than say, taking a medication for anxiety. And this was the interpretation of the study. This is what was discussed in the discussion section. For the vigilance study, they had volunteers press a space bar every time a dot skipped on a computer, and the dot skipped very infrequently. And if you've taken one of these attention tests before, you know how boring they can actually get, and oftentimes you just fall asleep. And they're able to show increased results on the space bar test with the informed and stimulated group. They were also able to show that they reversed the trends of certain brain waves, meaning that alpha in the stimulated group became more prominent, meaning that they had more relaxed attention, whereas in the control group, the people that were not being stimulated, delta became more prominent, meaning that they were getting more drowsy as the test went on, as it became more bored, but they were able to reverse that trend in people that were getting stimulated. And one drawback of the vigilance study is that some measures in the group that were stimulated with the device failed to meet statistical significance. So certainly more work needs to be done there. The app was easy to find and install off the App Store. I honestly like how it's simple and clean without too many features to confuse users. Basically, it has a usage log, support information, some device information with a few operational settings, and then the stimulation protocols. You can go into the stimulation protocols and see what stimulation frequencies are being used and learn about them, and then pick the duration of action. If I had one criticism, it's a bit difficult to stop a session once it has started, and I had to exit out of the app completely to pick a new protocol if I changed my mind about what settings I wanted to use. So that might be room for improvement in future software upgrades. So the device itself is quite elegant and simple, really. It's this ring of plastic with rubber on the inside. It's got the magnetic coils embedded within it so that uh, the coils can generate that moderate uh, magnetic field in order for the transmetic stimulation to occur while you are wearing it. And you actually wear it in different positions depending on what settings you've got it on, on the phone. So it comes with extra padding. If it doesn't fit on your head correctly, you can put extra padding on the device itself. Um, it's got this tap mechanism where it vibrates when you, you have to make sure to tap right over the light here in order to turn it on and off and get it going when you've actually picked sessions. At first I was like, well, why didn't they just put a dial on it or a button to, to start it? But I can actually see where they were trying to maintain that elegance where they don't want buttons on it and they wanted this cool touch and gesture control and it works just fine. It's not difficult to use at all. So um, the tap gesture control is actually pretty neat. One thing that I think that they could have done better is this little light here that lights up when the device is actually on and activated. Uh, they could have done something a little bit more futuristic. Muse S and Think had pretty cool futuristic lighting schemes that um, were more in line with what a cool wearable would look like. Um, so that might be something that they can improve on future versions. But what's actually really most important about this device is actually if it works or not, just like I said at the beginning of this video, and I'm here to tell you guys that this device works. I've been using it for uh, relaxation settings. I've been using it for attention settings. I even used it last night on the sleep setting because I had difficulty getting to sleep because I was reading all this stuff before bed as is like a bad habit of mine. And my mind was racing. So, um, 
you know, after trying to sleep for about an hour or two and, and not really being able to fall asleep, I uh, did put this on for about 20 minutes in the sleep setting. And what I've noticed about the uh, sleep and relaxation settings is that it really does slow your brain down in terms of if you're having uh, thinking that's going all different directions and your mind is sort of racing, thinking about a lot of different things, it really can slow things down. And I noticed when you wear it for meditation, for instance, that it reduces mind wandering. Uh, mind wandering is like a big challenge when it comes to meditation, especially when you're trying to just focus on the breath or the meditation object and go deeper into meditation. And what I've noticed about a lot of the different settings is that it reduces that mind wandering so that you can focus on the breath and you know relax into the meditation. I have noticed in meditation that I've tried to use the attention settings on this in order to sort of like wake myself up or have more mental energy to get into the meditation. And that doesn't work as well as the relaxation settings for uh, meditation, getting deeper into meditation. So I did notice that an alpha state is much more effective than a beta gamma state in the neurostimulation using this device. So I've showed it to my friends and family. Pretty much everybody that tries it says, it's actually doing something. We don't know what exactly, but it actually is making me feel different. And that's what I think is so awesome and uh, great about this device is it has this novel mechanism of action that we covered that is actually inducing your brain into different subjective and objective states measured by biomarkers. And you know, we took some time going through those scientific papers to take a look at skin conductance, to take a look at different brain waves. And I think that more research needs to be done. They need to have more uh, study subjects than like 25 people in order to, uh, you know, really def definitively answer these questions that are raised about uh, what is this actually doing to the brain. And you know, Dr. Igor would readily agree with that, but uh, I think that those papers were able to show that something is physiologically happening to the people that wear this device, um, both in their mind and in their body. And uh, you know, I think that it was somewhat mixed results on the the brain waves. Um, but as Dr. Igor said, you know, they need to systematically go through the different settings in order to see what it does to the brain waves, and they got uh, results that they didn't really expect. So this is a completely new technology with a novel mechanism of action. It is creating um, states within the brain that uh, you know sounds like have never really been seen before. So for the biohacking enthusiasts, I think that this device is a must. I I, I can't see myself really being interested in. Um, you know, changing my brain waves and being a neurohacker and not trying this device just because I think that it's so unique. Uh, you know, one of the things that came to my mind immediately when I put this device on in the relaxation settings was it, it feels like alpha stimulation. And alpha stimulation is a clinical FDA approved device that you see in a lot of mental health clinics and actually uses direct electrical stimulation through the earlobes uh, most of the time in order to induce an alpha state. But I always felt like the alpha stem devices made me feel a little like kind of drunk and woozy, to be honest. And when I did this device, it calmed me down, but I didn't feel that wooziness. And that's exactly what Dr. Igor said in that paper. And I had come to that conclusion before I even read the paper. So reading the paper and then um, seeing how he spoke about, hey, it's increasing in alpha state, but also the beta keeps high as well. So you don't feel as drowsy and woozy as if you took a medication, for instance. And I will say that also about this device is the effects are subtle. Uh, you will notice the effects, but it's not gonna be like taking a stimulant medication for vigilance, or it's not gonna be like taking a benzodiazepine for anxiety. It's not gonna be that powerful, but you definitely will notice changes. And as he states in the paper, it probably has a lot less side effects than pharmaceuticals or even high intensity transmitted stimulation that causes the depolarization of action potentials in the brain. Uh, because if it's more of a subtle effect, it probably has less side, of, side effects. So that it has that going for it as well. So that pretty much wraps up this video. This device actually does work. Uh, you know, we went through the scientific studies. I showed some clips of my interview with Dr. Igor German. I'm going to post that entire interview that I did with him uh, next week. So be, uh, stay tuned on the Tech for Psych YouTube channel in order to see that whole interview in which we dive into deeper about the history of the company that he works for and the different scientific research studies that they did in order to validate the science behind this device. Um, I did want to mention that I'm doing Instagram now as well. So if you want to go to Cody Rawl underscore Tech for Psych on Instagram, I'm available there and I've been uh, doing some social media posts just to show like back, background behind the scenes of Tech for Psych a little bit more to the audience that wants to see that. Um, again, 
Really highly recommended the NeoRhythm device. I'm gonna have more videos on this coming out. I'm gonna uh, compare it to some of the other neurostimulation wearables that I have as well. And uh, thanks so much for